Okay, we're going to do another session of me thinking out loud to the audience. This time it's going to be less about the structure of the engine and a little bit more of a game design thing. Now I know if you're on my YouTube channel, you're probably here for the programming and maybe not so interested in the game design. But in this case, I have to do the game design part too. And, uh, you know, I, I just have a, a generally a philosophy that when you're programming, if all you think about is the programming part of your programming, you're not going to be able to, to do as well. And since what I'm building is a, well, what I'm researching is, is about story in games. If I don't spend some of the time thinking about the game design, I don't know that it can be very good. So let's talk a little bit about what I was originally shooting for in the game design and what did and didn't actually appear from that original hope in this seven day jam. Uh, what I'm looking for is to get to a point where the, the, the feeling you get from the story elements of the game is that they are exactly on the same level, same, same footing as the game mechanics. And there's maybe some reason to be skeptical that, that I'm going to achieve that because I, I think probably a lot of people who care about story and games have thought about this before, but I do think I am approaching it in a way that has a couple of unique features that give it a shot at working. Like I'm focusing on this interface that is strictly about narrative. So I'm not, I'm not going to have to animate a character doing something. I'm not going to have to create the logic that, that leads to uh, a certain set of behaviors being enforced or encouraged or implied through visuals, whether it be top down or 3d or whatever. There's all this stuff that would make it so much harder to, to tell a story through the medium. But when all you have to do is write the story, it does unlock a lot of that. It does not unlock everything. I should, I should clarify, there are things about writing that are hard. There's Writing itself is not easy. And writing this dynamic stuff has a lot of problems like you end up in situations where you need to conjugate your verbs often enough that it gets annoying where you want to say that somebody jumps over something but then you want to plug in that that a plural does the jumping and now it's like they jump instead of he jumps right the the words change in little ways and this is just english examples and if you wanted to translate your game into other languages you get even more problems where like the structure of the language might require more uh, conjugation and, and declension of uh, adjectives and nouns, and it might require other word forms here and there. There might be idioms that just sound terrible, or so, phrases that just sound terrible that need to be replaced with uh, better idioms and special cases that aren't needed in other languages. There's all kinds of headaches around focusing on language. However, I think that if you you know set that aside for now and just say like look i don't know how i'm going to translate this but i'm going to write it in english it's at least possible once you've picked that language um or picked whatever language you're going to use in my case it's english but when you've picked the language and you've dealt with the conjugation issues you have here and there the idiom problems that you have here and there it's not actually that hard to get to the point where it's doing the right thing in each case where at least sounds pretty good it's a little time consuming but in terms of the scope and range of what it can tell a story about it's a lot better so that's why i'm interested in this particular interface and why i'm it it, 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 it could i could easily see this seeming like a strange uh project from the outside but i think that it would be rather special to have the feeling that that the story in the game you're playing is something that you can sort of explore around and that you can get a feeling of it uh, sort of systematically understanding what you're trying to do and taking the story in, in a corresponding direction. And I'm not saying that it should be able to do that like an AI generatively generating a story, but more so almost the opposite, that it should intentionally show uh, 
or it should show that an author intentionally thought about this variation of the story that you're shooting for, right? Now, I think in order to get there, uh, I need to get a little bit more concrete about what I have in mind. So I think something like a roguelike is a useful framework for working on this because a few things that roguelikes have uh, really go well with this experiment that I'm running uh, or, or, or this feeling that I'm looking for. Um, the, the first thing that roguelikes have is that they're character centric. So it's pretty much the most universal thing that when you're playing a roguelike, you are a character and that fits well with storytelling. It's easier to tell a story about a character um, than to tell a story about a disembodied, you know, entity that controls a set of units on the field or something like that, right? Um, so, so that's that helps. But the, I think the bigger thing is that roguelikes, they're different every time you play, and that's an expectation of the genre, that you have runs and that they, you fail and you start over. And I think that while that might not be the exact same thing as the kind of story game I'm talking about, it's it's definitely pushes it in the right direction. So if I were to take interactive fiction, the way it normally goes is usually you start at the beginning of the game, it's the same graph that you're going to walk around inside of as if you started again tomorrow or if your friend played it last year. You always start at the same starting node on the same graph and you walk around inside of it to see what the author came up with. And that can involve some amount of creativity being expressed and, you know, systematicness, like, you know, if you're saying, I want to walk north, south, east, and west, and those things, north, south, east, and west, might get laid out in a grid that is systematic or something. But by and large, there's not a lot in those kinds of games that I have seen that feels like a system is coming in to play and, and determining what's going to happen next in a more dynamic way. If the author didn't think of what you what action you might come up with in a certain case, they just didn't program the parser to recognize the verb or they you know didn't give you the clickable action verb for that particular thing or they disabled it or whatever. So it's just whatever they thought of is supported and whatever they didn't isn't. And so I think it'd be accurate to say one of the things I want to see is that I can build a systematic way of exploring around the story ideas and you can find nooks and crannies and it may, hopefully you can find bugs like you know if you play Mario 64 they built a physics simulator uh, that is meant to control Mario's movement and his collision with objects and if you get really good at understanding the logic of it you can make physically ridiculous things happen. I would think it would be an achievement for you to accomplish the same thing with a dynamic story system, right? If, if someone makes a story system that you can push and explore and, and, and move around it in all kinds of crazy ways that seem within the bounds of story, but then they get so skilled at manipulating the story engine that they manage to make ridiculous stuff happen too, that would be a step forward because that's not really a possibility in the way we do stories interactively right now. So I like that's kind of where my head is at. I want uh, the stories to integrate with dynamic, pr systematic game design ideas. Okay, so what's an example of how... I achieved that in this current game jam then. At the beginning of the game, in this game jam, you are presented with the choice of one of three different sort of archetypes of why you are going to go explore the dungeon. And this choice then sets you up as a player character type. And that's sort of strictly normal game game uh, game logic stuff presented through narrative. So that's like one piece of what I think is possible is that a lot of times it's it, it, it's possible to take what would be a story games like strict graph logic thing and say oh by making this just choice it's not just that you've you've um, you set a set yourself down a particular path of the graph uh, 
but what you've actually done is you've made a choice of like what class you're playing and what class you're playing uh, matters in systematic ways. So like it might determine how many hits you can take in combat. It might determine uh, what skills you have, what things you're able to access early on and what things will be hard for you later and, or something like that, right? It systematically uh, determines things about what's coming next. And this is different from if you're writing a story game where you make a decision at the beginning and you just hand pick like, okay, if you chose this, then this character is offended. And so in this interaction, they behave this way. If every piece of con, if every time there's an early choice that has a consequence later requires the programmer to think of that consequence and script out the behavior of the individual entities involved, then it's not systematic. It has to be, in order for it to qualify as systematic, it has to be something more like, oh, I can understand that the system works off of an idea of me having a certain amount of health or a certain amount or a certain set of skills. And, uh, and the system will allow certain behaviors based on, on those parameters. And so then you can sort of see that the, the consequence is chopped into two pieces, right? There's the choice of what character archetype you are is a choice which sets those parameters in your character. Those parameters in your character go into a system which you can then reason about and determine and predict how it's going to influence other things in the game, right? So then you can start to go and think through things like, oh, wait, I bet I could actually get the same outcome using the other character archetype that I didn't think was possible before because I think I could manipulate the systematic part of the game to get into a state where uh, I actually do have enough hit points to take to take on this challenge, and the way I would do that is through this other mechanic mechanism I've just discovered, or you know I can s subvert the challenge in this other way that is a part of the system, right? So those are just things that a game can enable that just strict fixed graph thinking can't where you're not reasoning from, do I think the writer allowed this idea? You're reasoning from, does the game's uh, system allow it? And then you can see how, if you start to also understand that your decisions that do craft the story along the way, like what character you're playing, if that story relevant decision has an imprint but in the systematic part of the game by influencing some of the systematic parameters, then there's a sort of chain of reasoning of characters of this type would be able to achieve this because after their parameters get initialized this way, they can be manipulated, manipulated that way, and then I can achieve that goal, right? So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully I, I could be very much in the weeds and rambling in a way that nobody is following. But that's what I'm looking for. And in the game that I made in the Game Jam has that. You pick a character archetype and different things about the characters. The, the archaeologist is able to read languages that the other characters aren't, so they're able to get slightly different um, pieces of the story by playing that way, but they also have less speed and strength than the other two archetypes, so they have a higher challenge to deal with the things in the dungeon. Uh, and, you know, if I had more time, which I didn't, this is just a piece of content I didn't get to fill in, they were going to be able to unlock an ending that isn't available. So it's almost like a hard mode. They got less powerful stats, but they go in with the ability to play the play an end game that's only available to them because of that special knowledge they start with. Unless I decide at some point to, you know, make that difference in their, in what languages they speak systematic, if it's possible to magically learn to understand the same clues or to get access to that information another way, right? If, if there are clues written in this ancient language that only the archaeologist can read, but the game is systematically tracking if you have the knowledge of all three clues to control whether you access the special end game, maybe there's a way for the other characters to gain access to the special end game that is more roundabout uh, because they don't speak the language. And so now again, you can see how you can mix the the story choices with systematic things that the player can manipulate. Uh, so I didn't get to do a lot of that kind of stuff. Another thing I didn't get to work on is I didn't get to work on uh, character interaction. So it's not like I have any dialogue in the game jam. And I think that's a shame. That's one of the biggest things I got to get 
better at is figuring out how that's going to fit in. I would love to have, I would love to have an understanding of how, uh, something like a dialogue tree could be incorporated in to a game. Uh, Cause I don't, I don't think the dialogue tree is bad entirely. I think that it it's bad because it doesn't, incorporate it, it doesn't cash out any of the systematic ideas that i'm talking about uh in a way that is super interesting so um i didn't get to play with that another thing i don't have a lot of is there's a combat system in the game jam and the combat system super systematic but what i would i don't feel that the combat system turned out super interesting and that's partly because i'm not super experienced with building turn-based rpgs so i might need to spend some time just practicing the game design of turn-based RPGs to understand how to craft a turn-based RPG that has properties closer to what I would want. Uh, another thing I did that was unusual is it's not turn-based as in player one, player two, player one, player two. It's turn-based as in multiple rounds of like a uh, game theory game. So it's simultaneous action. Me and the a you know the bot for the, that controls the enemy both make a decision at the same time and i think that's an interesting direction but i need to spend more time tinkering with that and figuring out how to build with that game design idea but the other thing i didn't get to do that i think would be cool is to blend uh systematic stuff like the combat system with story stuff so for instance i had this idea to add bears and i did add bears but i didn't get to add the feature i wanted which is that you know, usually when you're in combat, if you run, the other thing, um, you know, it, it always has the ability to try to chase you. Uh, but if the other thing you're fighting uh, didn't try to fight you, if the thing, if you run away and the thing you were seeing, like, made no move, they, they, they paused or they were doing defensive or they also ran, all of those lead to just your end of the encounter. But I thought it would be cool if there were, like, Override. So the systematically, whether or not you can choose to run is based on how much energy you have. And then if you do choose to run, usually it gets handled a certain way. But maybe if you're facing a bear, the the rule is, hey, even if the bear was just waiting and watching you, uh, maybe with the bear, if you run, it gets a reaction that is immediate, which is that it just fights you instead. And so the usual rule that if something uh, if you run from something when you know that what its action is going to be is wait and you're guaranteed to get away, it gets replaced with, well, in this case, there's a different rule. And I think this starts to be cool because if you look at um, if you look at what that leads to, it leads to lots of separate variations of the same game, right? If I build a game where there are four actions and a bunch of, and a bunch of systematic rules about how they get processed, and then in certain scenarios, I have ways of overriding one of them or a couple of them in special ways. I can override the behavior of the normal system so that this new scenario feels a little bit different, has slightly different rules. It's still mostly systematic, but now you get to explore a different variant of the rules in that case, and you can line that up with the story, right? I didn't get to explore any of that. And so there are questions there about how I want to structure systematic uh interaction like systems that are systematic game systems that have that you know systematic set of you know pro the way of being processed and also include uh the ability to override the default processing with specific processing that that uh is sort of special to certain entities so that there is a a variety of different games all interwoven together. So it's like you have a base mini game and a bunch of pieces can get thrown into that and stitched together by the store, like the larger story structure of the game. And then a bunch of those mini games are actually slight variations of the base mini game that are also stitched together within each other. So you have this big web then of mini games that lead to other mini games that are all variations of each other. And I start to, this, then my vision, I hope, hopefully after describing that, and if you followed this far, it starts to become more clear what I'm thinking is possible, which is that you 
build all these mini games, the larger structure of the narrative glues them together. And over time, as you craft it, if you do a good job, it does take game design, you start to hopefully see this um, emerging thing. And since it's a roguelike too, you, it's also random a little bit. So every time you're experiencing the pieces in different ways, but I think that it doesn't have to be a roguelike, right? So the, these these interacting mini games are all um, related to each other by the sort of larger game system structures that you've decided. Like when when one of them ends and you go into another one is decided by you. Uh, the various ways they can evolve and the pieces you throw into them are decided by you. And they're also all related to the main narrative you're trying to let the player explore. And they are sort of held together in that narrative. And so now you can start to strategize like, well, maybe if I uh, go through the story in this order, so I get to this real st stage of the B plot with this character earlier, then that'll unlock a way that I could deal with these encounters differently. And, you know, you can start to see what I'm picturing, which is which is you the the framework of narrative becomes a vehicle for your thinking uh rather than you know what we have in games now where if it's a game that you do a lot of strategizing about it's usually strategizing over you know how to route through space quickly or how to uh you know how to optimize a particular build in a certain way this is how to pull the different threads of the narrative and i think that it create i think you could just as easily uh strategize about rather abstract related interrelated mini games if they're all held together in a narrative framework that makes sense to you and once you've gone that far you could then take away the roguelike piece right the roguelike piece pushes me in the direction of proceduralness once i figure out how to make a narrative with these properties i mean narrative game with these properties in a roguelike i can imagine it doesn't have to be random. You could take all these tools and actually start everyone at the beginning of the game with the same state every time. And yet the game would have such so many interest, intricate dynamic narrative systems that there'd be so many unique routes through it that, that and you could even take out RNG. And yes, each route, if you did, played a run exactly the same way, it would be identical. But, uh, but the 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 possibility that there are other interesting routes that you have yet to think of, but that you can think of because they're so systematic, um, I think would lend a new kind of excitement to exploring the narrative structure, right? So that's what I want it to be like. I've talked a little bit about what I didn't get to achieve. I didn't get to do characters. I didn't get to do overriding the base mini game with special pieces and i've spent about 23 24 minutes now it looks like rambling about all this i hope it wasn't too boring but i got all those ideas out there so that now i can go and look at a couple of the key reasons why i don't think i succeeded uh at capturing the best um parts of this idea so here's a snippet from the uh intro fragment of the game jam uh the very first sort of chunk here is what it does is it describes uh, the three different character archetypes and I've snapshotted one of those. Uh, and you can see if we focus on the payloads here, remember this is the game jam version of the payload system. So it's very much sloppy. What's happening is I call set purpose, which is just basically setting a particular uh, global uh, variable inside the game state. Uh, because I didn't have a better way to remember this choice when I first started, like on day one, I didn't have any systematic things existing yet. So when I was testing out that this worked, I just chose that. If I knew what kind of game I was building, this might be more like choose like, choosing a parameter for how to generate the game world or a part of a character entity system or something like that. None of that exists. So it just goes into this global variable calling, called the purpose. Um, then I run generate world, and then I change my fragment directly. So there's a, literally a link here. Now this is where this is pulled directly from classical, traditional interactive fiction thinking. The initial state was the intro state. I was looking at the intro of the game. The player made a choice about what to, 
they wanted where about what you know action to take they were given a set of a discrete set of actions and they chose one of them and that discrete action uh has in it a link to the next fragment now if if i was 100 percent in the most uh boiled down lame version of interactive fiction that's the only thing that would be there the fact that they're setting a game purpose and generating the world is is hints that there's something a little bit more systematic going on uh, that link from one story fragment to the next is a vestige of the non-systematic way of constructing a uh, story game. All right, now here's a snippet from how I wrote the dungeon exposition, which is the, the we, we were on the intro. Like I said, we had a, a wire going from that state straight to the next state, which is the dungeon exposition state. So the game engine didn't get a chance to process something and decide what to do. The, the story fragment itself hard-coded what the next state would be. And now we're looking at that next state. That next state uh, tells us a little bit more as this is the exposition. It's telling us a little bit about the dungeon. And uh, here it's saying, hey, everything you know about the dungeon comes from rumors that have been passed between fellow and then there's a blank, and a blank is determined in the lamest excuse for a systematic way that there can be, which is a switch. It either says Thieves or Beast Slayer. So there's not like it looks at the game, you know, the player entity and chooses this. It's not like it's picking the exposition uh, uniquely from a set of content of different ways to create an exposition or something. I've just hard-coded one possible exposition, and whether you're a thief or a beast slayer, I swap in the correct word here, right? So it's like a Mad Lib with two different things you can plug in. The blank only has two options, and which option it picks is based on whether you which purpose it saved earlier. So this could almost have been just two separate states, you could imagine, but there'd be a lot of duplicates. So all this is doing is kind of deduplicating two states, but it's still two states. I, I hard transitioned to this state from another state, and I also hard saved the variables at the same time as I was doing that transition. So this is basically just um, code compression on two separate states. And along the way, I happened to write basically identical. Uh, the, the, two, the two blurbs are basically identical. The only part where the compression didn't completely zip them up into one string is for swapping in what kind of uh, like a whether, whether this person is a thief or a bee slayer, right? And then there's a little bit more like that underneath. There's another switch. I'm showing, not showing you this part. I'm just reading off what I see here. There's, um, you know, another switch, a little bit more shared text. Then it gets to this interesting part here. So the only text you'll see hard-coded here is first, then, and finally. Or rather, first, then, and, and finally. Uh, and then what's happening is I'm taking each of those and setting them side by side with uh, a thing that says like fancy content is the function call. It's grabbing some uh, variables out of an array, uh, it's grabbing some slots out of an array in the game state logic block and asking for the QU game property exposition right next to that. So, so what this means is let me show you uh, the table this looks up into. Okay, so over here you can see where I have I have this X list. It's actually a rather big X list. It's in a separate file, and I have the each of these macros that says X underscore stir lit uh, is defining three things. The first thing it defines is uh, a thing. That we'll call like a keyword. So the, the first keyword here in the screenshot is vampire. Then the second one is the property. So that's X position. And then the third thing is a string literal. Okay. So if we look at again at that piece of uh, code that generates the first, then, and, and finally, uh, after the first, what does it do? It, it, it looks at a, an array called reveal pieces. These are the pieces the game is going to reveal to the player and grabs one of these keywords. So a keyword is actually just an enum. Each of the keywords in the game uh, is specified as one of the values in this enum. 
and then it puts in the exposition property. Now, in their full form, the keywords and the properties have a prefix of QU underscore game key and QU underscore game property. In the X list version, I drop those out for brevity. And then when I go to actually look up into the table, right? So what's happening is whenever I want to find, for instance, if I've got the vampire keyword and I want its exposition, the fact that those are uh, stored over here as an X list, in a, a macro X list, what that means is I can form like a switch or if I want like a, an array or something, I can use, I can use the preprocessor at, to organize this information and then generate out whatever code I need that uh, lets me look up using a, a keyword and a property on that keyword, a particular string, right? I can also, I'm not, I've got a screenshot for the, of this for you. I can also attach story fragments there. So instead of putting a string literal, I could take one of these story fragments, which remember is a, is a function pointer and put that there. So I can either say, Hey, the, the exposition for this vampire is a, just a string, or it's another uh, story fragment function, call that story fragment function, and that will fill in more stuff. That That's cool because that can mean that it's dynamic. It might then go look up at other pieces of state and reveal different things and so on. So this is a part that I think is I, I'm more happy with. I like this system. It felt like I could do a lot with it. Uh, I can imagine a lot of improvements to it. So uh, it's not clear to me that, you know, it's it's not particularly fun or easy to m manipulate an X list. It's better than making my own scripting language, especially in seven days. Uh, you could also imagine doing this with something like JSON, which might be better, but it would have the downside that once it's in JSON, you ha don't have any linkage. Like there's no, it, it's not very easy to tell a JSON file uh, to to check that uh, a name matches a the name of a function somewhere in your code. Whereas with this, if I want to point um, a particular property at a story fragment instead of a string literal, I can just point it, just put the name of the function there. And it, since it's all going through the C compiler, the C compiler knows whether or not that exists and generates some uh, errors if it doesn't, right? Uh, doing the same thing with JSON wouldn't really work or I'd have to still write a preprocessor that runs before the build or something else, right? So it's not the worst system. It's not pretty, but I'm happy with that. And what this let me do is very easily just start doing stuff um, that could plan to be systematic. Now the exposition was a little clunky. Uh, I think this is partly because it's just hard to write. It's hard to write, uh, like you run into this situation where you're trying to list out some stuff and what I'd love to think about more, and this is one of the areas where there's some research to do on what's possible in terms of generating language, generating like natural language as an interface. Uh, one of the things I would love to be able to do better is right now when I was showing the player what they knew about the dungeon, I showed them like first comma and then one of the exposition pieces, then space and one of the exposition pieces. And I had to write each exposition piece so that it could come after first comma, then space, and finally comma. I didn't really get to reveal this exposition stuff in a way that felt super narratively nice. And so I'd love to think, first of all, from a perspective of writing, what's a good way to write this exposition? Is it a discussion between characters? Is it reading something out of a book, right? What would be the way I would want in my story to reveal this information? Uh, which I didn't get have time to think through. And if I was going to reveal information through different channels, like if I'm going to have the possibility that you learn about one of the game pieces, which is a vampire through, uh, through the channel of, you know, somebody else telling you about it. And then in a different run, you're going to learn about the vampire, but I've already decided you're going to learn about the dragon through the person who talks to you. Then does that mean that the vampire can also be revealed through, um, reading about something and does that mean I have to write completely different text for every combination of thing that I want to include in the exposition and channel of exposition that is maybe just what you need to do uh, if you want to do this kind of stuff it might also be possible that, that there are techniques for like hey if you're going to reveal a vampire you always reveal it the same way 
And so like, if it's going to be through conversation, that conversation just has to happen and you have to set up the, set up the path for that to happen. Um, right. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. This is an interesting part of the issue or an interesting issue with this stuff is how to manage how much writing you have to do and how to still achieve the final writing that comes out being of a high quality. And I didn't really spend time on that here, but I do think that the system I have is already close to what you would need. But it might be worth spending a little bit more time experimenting here and saying like, hey, let's let's chop if if I do roll back a lot of the game I made and sort of take things more step by step, I'd be interested to see how bad it gets if I try to take, you know, so I got four different things I want to write expositions for. If there are a few different ways to learn about each of them in the game, and that leads to like you have to write 12 blobs of exposition because you got four different things uh, that might be put into each slot and three different slots that all need a different style of writing, then, uh, then you know, like, is that too much? It's just 12 blobs. I mean, I feel like it could be done. I don't think that's crazy, but is it kind of annoying when you're like creatively thinking about, Hey, I got a couple more ideas for, you know, mini bosses for the game. Maybe I, now I want to go and look at that and I don't want to have to write three for each of them. So then you start to come up with, maybe you want systems where like, Hey, for the vampire, I wrote a way that you can hear about it in a conversation. I wrote a way that you can hear about it from a book. For the dragon, I wrote a way that you can hear about it uh, by over by eavesdropping, and uh, I wrote about a way that you can read about it in a book. And for the leviathan, I wrote a way that you can read about it in a book, and that's it, right? And then have the game engine have tools that automatically automatically goes, okay, we randomly picked what the pieces in the game are. What's the best way to deliver exposition for the pieces we have given that some of them have different options right so if i come up with a new thing to add to the game that's a new mini boss i wouldn't have to go and write every flavor of exposition but rather i would have tools that help me say like okay just add one and then it exists and then if you come up with other ways to do the exposition you just you just declare them and the engine or your your game logic uh, rather, what I want to say is that your game logic has uh, the ability to automatically use the pieces you've provided, and the game engine or like supporting libraries include tools that make it easy to write the game logic that does all of that, right? So I have some ideas there about uh, what that might look like, and I'd like to spend more time ex exploring that. Okay, so I'm skipping uh, ahead just a little bit here. So let me tell you what I skipped. At the end of the exposition, there's a single option to advance to, by going to the dungeon. And when you go to the dungeon, it describes the dungeon entrance to you, and there's a single option to enter the dungeon. Now, you could find that annoying that like you are twice given an option, which is a single advance option. I think of it as just turning the page. Maybe it would be better to you know, upgrade the interface so that if I wanted to show lots of text and transition from uh, just like background knowledge you have to visceral, you're in this place, you see this thing, kinds of text that there's just like a turn the page kind of interaction that feels and looks different from game actions and game choices. I haven't built that, not too worried about it. That's a that's a matter of presentation and aesthetics that can that will fit in into pretty much any architecture if the architecture itself is not uh, busted, right? So that's stuff that I'm concerned about for later. The more interesting thing here in the snapshot I showed you uh, about this is there's this idea of a language check that's happening. And this is sort of what fit into a larger system that uh, I wanted for this particular game idea, which is the idea of like knowledge checks. And I think that that would actually matter in a lot of different types of story games. Um, so in this case, the language check is asking, does our player character know the specific in-game language and it is revealing different information 
through through the writing depending on what the player knows. So if the player doesn't know this ancient language, they just get a message that says there's writing on the arch in a language that you don't recognize. Uh, but if you do know the language, then it says there's text inscribed on the arch, and here's what it says, right? Uh, so the part of this, that's, that's not actually that interesting. That's just an example of something being systematic a little bit, which is, hey, there's this idea of the player does or doesn't know a language, and uh, we do or don't reveal stuff. Now, if you were writing a super highly controlled interactive fiction experience, this might still be something you would do, but you'd have like it stuff strongly gated like, oh, you need to know the language by this point to make progress and you always can get to knowing the language by this. This is a part of why I liked the roguelike idea. By starting with a roguelike, I'm just saying, hey, there might be multiple paths to victory. Sometimes the path has to be different every game anyways. So not only is it likely that there are multiple paths, there probably have to be multiple paths because if I only had one path to victory in a roguelike, how would you like you you need you need to be able to learn how to get there through repetition rather than by memorization and and so on the flip side the game has to know that it's provided a path. If you wanted you could make a game that knows it's provided a path and has only made one path possible. But much more often the way you make sure there's a path is that there's actually ample um, resources and it's just quite difficult to master the skill of using those resources efficiently enough to get there but once you've gotten to the point of doing it successfully a few times you start to realize there's more than enough to get there every time so it's always probably possible to win same idea here you don't need to know this language that gives you this extra information so i can just start doing things that are like hey you either do or don't know and you either do or don't get the information from this and i don't think too much about is this gonna mean they have a bad experience or does this mean that it won't work they're not going to get jammed up on one thing anymore the roguelike genre has freed me up to just say hey if the game state is in a certain way then the narrative that is provided uh, is different than if it, the game state was in a different certain way. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the, the knowledge system because I think that would be interesting to talk about briefly. The, the it, I'm not sure that it belongs at the level of a game engine, but I think it would be fairly common because a big part of knowledge that's interesting is what does our player themselves actually know? And this is a little different from the knowing the language, right? So in, in this snippet I showed you, that we're asking, does the player character know this language and changing the text one way or the other. But another thing that's in that same snippet is progress this to do progressive text. And that is similar, but different. So this is the idea of what has the player been exposed to so far. If I write some really colorful text that describes the elaborately, the characteristics of the unknown language and what the writing in this unknown language looks like and the feelings it evokes when you see it. And then you see it at the beginning of the game, that's fine. If I then systematically end up having five more instances through the game where the same exact mes message can show up, um, that starts to get a little weird, right? If you have really elaborate writing that repeats itself, that starts to feel weird. And so there's this idea I have that like, a part of making this high quality is if you think about what a what would a, an author do is they might say like okay I want to explain what it's like for the character to see this really strange writing for the first time and then start to shorten that so the next time they see it it maybe gets a mention and a sentence uh, that reflects some of the original ideas but it's shortened and then as the character they're writing about becomes more and more familiar with it the the reader also becomes more and more familiar with it and so they uh, appropriately adapt what they say about it to be shorter and shorter to the point of just saying matter of factly there's more of the writing i don't need to elaborate on how it makes me feel because first of all you've already heard it and second of all our character is getting used to it too so it's not likely that the elaborate description which was appropriate the and the first initial experience remains interesting now and you can see this a lot in, write, in writing where people do a lot of world building where new ideas are elaborate at first and then as they are repeated, they get reduced down to shorthands and then become just commonplace singular words or a couple of word phrases that reference those big ideas.
And so the idea of progressive text was to progress how you describe something uh, system like uh, that it might be getting generated in a systematic way, right? Every time the player encounters this unknown language, I might want to say something about that. Like I might want to let them know they've encountered it, but I don't need to elaborate. And I want to initially elaborate quite a bit. And I didn't elaborate that much in the, in the text you can actually see here because, uh, well, just, just because. But if I did want to elaborate and I had the time to write the elaboration, I still wouldn't want it to show up the second and third and fourth and fifth time that they might run into the same kind of situation. So another thing I want to play with is uh, building a game that has a progressive text system. Until I've built it, I won't know how well it works and what challenges might be involved in making it work well. Uh, so that's something I need a little bit more practice with in these kinds of systems is is actually building that uh, that feature in. All right, here's the last snippet that I think we'll look at in this session. And this is at the end of the dungeon entrance. This is the... Uh, the, the button, essentially, the interactive text that actually lets you begin the game. And you can see here uh, that th the payloads don't involve changing the fragment anymore. So earlier, the intro and the exposition directly changed the fragment, like hard-coded wires moving forward. This is where that stopped working, because as soon as you enter the dungeon, a systematic uh, piece of the game takes over. You enter the dungeon, and it is going to need to do some things like decide your location, which is not like a XYZ location. Your location is determined uh, by saying which entity you are like local to. So your, your location basically is an entity pointer that everything that is not the, your current location is away from you. And one thing at most is the current location, right? And there are various things that can be your location, which are all entities in the system. So it's like a discrete location, essentially. So it sets your location at the entrance, and then it runs this command to begin a dungeon floor. And beginning a dungeon floor is a unique command uh, rather than a change of fragment for a couple of reasons. When you begin the dungeon floor, it's going to show... Uh, it is going to transfer eventually to a particular fragment, uh, but it might do something different depending on whether you've uh, been to this dungeon floor before. It also might want the opportunity at the beginning of a dungeon floor to initialize some things on the dungeon floor that weren't initialized during the world generation itself. Uh, things like that, right? So this is a command that is separate. It is not just saying, here's a wire transfer. It is telling the game to run some systematic game stuff. And so the payload now is carrying with it not a wire that transfers from one state of the story graph to another state in the story graph, but rather a command to run the systematic game stuff. That's it, that, that systematic game stuff is then supposed to decide what story fragment to show next. Now, obviously, in the architecture I'm proposing, that wouldn't happen. There wouldn't be what story fragment to show next. Rather, it would update the state of the... Uh, it would update the entire state struct and then whatever it renders from that update uh, would would reflect the new state of the game, which does not have to, you know, actually be a different uh, story fragment. It just means that the state of the game is influencing the, the fancy string rendering differently. Well, I'm getting a little bit into the weeds trying to describe that distinction. So if it's not clear, forget that part. What's more interesting that I'm trying to talk about is... This only like half feels like what I want. Um, it is passing the baton to something a little more systematic, which is this begin dungeon floor function. But that's a very specific game command still. So when I said enter the dungeon, uh, and this might be because it's the beginning of the game that it feels a little off, but begin dungeon floor is not that much better than a hard wire transfer. Here, let me show you. Okay, so there you have it. What this command literally actually does is set the current fragment to the begin region fragment. It doesn't do anything else. And this is partly because the game just didn't become sophisticated enough. But 
this is where I start to feel like I I didn't quite land where I wanted. And uh, from this point onward, the game becomes extremely systematic, so much so that it's too far that direction. But up until this point, the entire initialization of the game is very discreet story graph style. And this piece here was where I felt like it's time to become systematic, but the first step was still this basically a hard wire that I, I imagined here in Begin Dungeon Floor, other things might happen. It might generate a um, random encounter, but I felt like, well, no, hold on. There is a pacing to storytelling that I still need to adhere to. And, and I want when you first walk into the dungeon, the story shouldn't be you encounter a rat. It's like, enter the dungeon, you encounter a rat. Like, what kind of story is that? I wanted it to be like, you get a chance to hear described elaborately the, the first moments of entering into the dungeon before anything else happened. Just like, what is the dungeon itself? Like what, what, here's the piece where we get to just a few sentences of flavor about what that moment is for you as the character. And then that can flow into, you know, making decisions about how to handle situations that start to, you know, be decisions that are systematic but there's a downside to that, which is like, yes, at the beginning of the game, that's what I want. But later on in the game, it might make sense to say you as you as you descend right here. I'm going to just read. I'm going to I'm going to speak out what I wish the game read like later on. Right. It could say something like as you descend further into the dungeon, you see ahead of you a the glowing eyes of a fearsome dire rat or whatever right so it's now using a narrative interface to drop you right into an interaction uh but i didn't have that option because i systematically chose that the beginning of a region is always just drop you into this begin region fragment and there's no processing here of initializing a combat encounter or or other kinds of things right so this, again, is maybe highlighting the, the limitations of the current fragment thing. I think I have some ideas of what might lead to more dynamics in terms of describing the state. But there's also, or like describing the state as data, not uh, in the narrative interface, but literally describing the, the state uh, in the hard data of the game logic. Uh, but the other thing that's sort of happening here is the, there's a tension between the pacing of storytelling and the transition into systematic game logic stuff that I have not learned how to how to navigate. And there's a transition happening here, which is hard and fast. And I think that probably the key, the most important thing, if I was going to unroll all the decisions I made uh, and try to improve stuff, I've already given some of the ideas of things I would try to improve, but this piece here feels like where I need to experiment the most, which is how can I design the game to have to be systematic right here and to have the right story pacing at the same time, right? That's the piece that I need to spend some time exploring because if this can't be cracked, then I think that the, the, the wall between well-paced narrative and the systematic stuff that I want uh, the wall between them might be there for an un unsolvable reason. And so if this is a research project um, about finding solutions to hard problems, I think this is where the hardest problem of all lies. So I've got some ideas about how to improve the game engine, and that would be great stuff to work on. If I'm going to actually build like a super powerful version of this game engine with like content editors and really high performance and all of that i want to know that you can actually make the stuff i envision and whether or not that's possible comes down to whether or not i can figure out how to how to control this variable right here this this the, the, the interface between very carefully crafted narrative pace and systematic gameplay stuff. If I can blend them, then this rest of it is worth it. And if I can't, then the reasons why not are the interesting thing to learn about. So the only reason I'm not proposing that I just go straight into rolling my game back 
all the way and working on this exact moment is because even if I tried, I think that some of the structural stuff I chose was wrong. I think I think I got to do both at the same time. I got to know how to build the game engine to support systematic processes and I got to figure out how to craft this. So I need a slightly better version of the engine. I need to roll the game back and then I need to build back up to this point slower so that I can experiment with some other stuff. But I, I want to um, get to this point and rebuild the, the intro of the game more faithfully to my vision if I take another crack at this next. So thanks if you listen to this last hour of me talking about my game design ideas regarding these regarding this uh, project and uh, I apologize if this was a long rambling boring thing. I, I don't know why you made it to the end if that's how you feel about it, but I really, feel that talking all of this through has helped me to sort it all out and maybe by sharing it I can show other people uh, one way to do this sort of make some forward progress uh, analyze it and audit it yourself and take steps back and and adjust and try to capture your ideas in a different way hopefully that if anyone has gotten this far it has at least inspired or showed an example of that happening and it has been useful uh, thanks so much and uh, look forward maybe in another couple of weeks to updates on if any of these experiments have gone well <laughs>